I'm sure Mikko's name has been brought up to you plenty of times since you took the job. He's the, the last All-Ireland winning Kerry manager to take over Kildare. Mickey Hart here. You're listening to GAR Football Show. The GA Hour with Colin Parkinson is brought to you by Paddy Power, home of the Money Back Special. I'm not finished yet, it took me a long time to get here. Okay, Willie is not here, but he's left us a cracking interview with Jack O'Connor, which is coming up on the show very shortly. It's me and Connor to hold the fort for now, and we're going to get straight into free kick shootouts. Because, Jesus, there was some drama on Thursday night about this. I was watching it myself. Like, Antrim, in fairness to them, did an amazing job. They were live streaming uh, the free kick shootout, and... Like for the most part, like people think it's very harsh to lose a game on free kicks, and same way you think it's harsh to go out of a World Cup on penalties. But like you know, surely it has to be sorted in some some capacity. And actually, before uh, the free kick shootout, when Antrim announced that it was going to be a shootout, everybody just started replying to their Twitter account saying "Go live, go live, go live." And they went straight on the Periscope and there was 3.5 thousand people watching it. And I watched the whole thing. There was 10 free kicks each. And uh, this is before Kieran McAvaney stepped in. The chairman, the county chairman, stepped in and called the halt to it. Which, he was, he's getting a lot of credit for it. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm sort of shitting on here. The game is the county semi-final, the football semi-final between Lau Yarig, or Lam Derg as they say in Belfast, and Port Glenone. Went to um, extra time. This is already a replay. So they had played before, drew the game, played the replay, drew the game again. This was in the dub in Queens in Belfast. Um, went to a replay, or sorry, went to extra time. Couldn't be separated. So at about 10 o'clock, 10.30, they had to start the pe- the free kick shootout. But then like 10 free kicks in for each team. And Kieran McAvana stepped in and said, enough's enough. Now, what they did do wrong, Connor, I thought, and this is something that the GA can learn from going forward. Like, you used to have the free kick from the 45, which was ridiculous because not everybody can, can do that. Like, the idea of a penalty shootout, the drama of it is that, you know, you should score, really. Like, that's why you tune in because yeah. somebody's going to bottle it. Like, that's that's the whole entertainment value of it. So they brought, the, the free kicks are around the D, again, that's in the middle of the goals if you want. So you should really score, but you, you can miss as well if you shank it. Um... But what they did very badly here was you just had to pick five kickers and then they got to hit them again. So after the first five of Portland Owens, they were back to their best five again. So if you have your best, like your, yeah. your best five kickers are going to score most of them. Like, you know, the real beauty of it is when it's getting down to the cornerback or the keeper or somebody who doesn't want to hit a free, you know, yeah. stepping up. Like that that should be the way it's done. As, as harsh as it, is, as it is on the cornerback, yeah. it might be as uh, accomplished in front of goal as a free taker. But I agree that that's, that's that. That's the whole. That's the whole point of let's say penalty shootout, shootouts in the first place. That it eventually goes through the entire team or the entire squad, and somebody's going to miss, and it just it just so happens that it's going to be the the guy who's not as accomplished in front of goal that, that that that's going to be the going to be the fall guy in the end. But but just to say, like the the only time I've ever uh, put something on Periscope in my life is uh, I was actually asked, and I, I think this it could have been the first ever intercounty um, penalty shootout. But I was at the FPD game between Mayo and Leitrim. Oh yeah, uh, way back in January, uh, down in uh, Park um, John McDermott. The first was that the first shootout out of him, right? I, I I could be wrong, but it, like I I think it was definitely the first this season. Mayo were, were in another one with Galway, but um, I remember at the time we nobody in the crowd uh, was even though the, the rule had been brought in, nobody in the crowd was actually sure what was going to happen. And then it was announced over the the PA system that it was going to be penalty. So everybody, all the kids ran down from the stand to behind the goal. Uh, every, everybody, including myself, in the stand got it on, um, got it, you know, started filming it and getting it on Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. So just to, just to speak to the levels of excitement that it, that it does create, it, it's incredible. And, and, and like I myself, when I, when I saw, obviously there was a lot of kind of commotion around Twitter on um, Thursday night and, and I tuned in. I think by the time I tuned in, they were cancelling the <laughs> they were cancelling the free kick, so I, I missed out on it. But just but but that's um but like uh, obviously an FPD maybe you know the first round of the FPD doesn't have the same kind of um doesn't have the same implications let's say for the teams involved uh, as a as a as as the situation in Antrim did last night. But maybe we'll get to it. But my thing was that why step in after ten? Yeah. As opposed to not stepping in at the start. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, you're gonna do it. And then the decision to you know, you have to take that decision. You, you don't let the free kicks take person take place in the first place, as opposed to um, as opposed to deciding after ten of them that no, I'm going to put a yeah. stop to it. And I, and I know, and I can understand why the chairman was getting credit for me because a lot of people would be of the sentiment that you know that that shouldn't 
that shouldn't be the way that the game is decided. But that that's neither here nor there. You either decide that you're going to go ahead, or you decide that you're not. So, like, what happens tonight? You know, like I think it's exactly. on again tonight. Yeah. What happens tonight if it, if it's a draw again after extra time? Um, I'm sure they, I'm sure they have a contingency plan in place, but it'd be really interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. What happens when an intermediate team goes out on a free kick shootout, and then like they can just cite the county chairman or his quote, who said no team deserves to lose that way. Like you know, he, he's yeah. really sort of made a rod for his own back here. It's 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 dangerous stuff, and and you're 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 bang on like it. Like he's he's arbitrarily decided like you know like ten kicks is enough like if somebody had have missed the eighth kick or the ninth kick the game was over and it would have been decided that way he's decided that yeah ten thirty six p.m. is too late but ten thirty five p.m. isn't too late and this is an argument they always have with Willie sometimes you know when we talk about like rule changes and stuff like you can't have any you can't have any room for like grey areas they have to be black and white like and this yeah. is like I remember you know we were talking about this one where the forwards had to stay inside the forty five and I was. Sort of like I, was, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I was I was being cheeky enough, just like you know, what happens if there's a ball five meters away, and Willie was like, "Ah, the referee can decide." And it's like, what? What's the rule? Like, what? What is the rule? Like, and yeah. it's the same with this: is it a free kick shootout or not? Like, you know, and it, you know, even if you want to put into the rules, a game has to be ended by ten thirty p.m. Then you know, then then you're sort of covering yourself yeah. in that way. But I didn't like you know because he was talking about them. Um, no team deserves it. He said. Uh, we're going on about mental health a lot in the world now, and this is the GA bringing that to fruition as well. Just like I don't know, they were just loose enough quotes, and as big a credit as Antrim get for the coverage that they're giving the club championship, I just thought that was one man sort of going on his own sort of solo run, and like you know, without sort of consulting with everybody else. Like you take Cargan, Cargan thought they were in a final now this weekend. But no, that that's got pushed back a whole week because that, because of that this got week. pushed back because of the that got pushed back because of the extra time and the free kicks yeah being suspended on the Thursday night yeah and now we're having an extra game so now Cargan can play and you know so the whole things the whole things pushed back and you know people might have had plans around that but because of the solo run and like you know because like yeah he's getting a lot of um well wishes and and well done and whatever else but like Jesus this has to be a bit more official I think. Yeah, like, like in his defence, I think he just took the decision kind of in the spur of the moment. Yeah, and like his intentions, he he was, you know, I'm not going to doubt his intentions. They're entirely honourable. He did it for the sake of the players, for the sake of the clubs. Because you can imagine, like, whatever club lost out, there definitely would have been a prevailing sentiment afterwards to say that shouldn't happen. Do you know, even though even though it was in the rules, and even though the free kicks were allowed to take place, you would have had somebody on Friday. You would have had a collection of people, I would say, on Friday saying no club should go out. In that manner, so that that's that what was that's what was foremost in his head. But like, if if when you kind of get down to the nitty gritty, I mean, you kind of take sentiment out of the way. You know, it's it just it's, it's the arbitrary nature of deciding to step in after ten, and then like I think we're gonna we're probably gonna talk about club pictures again, and and rescheduling of club pictures again. But but it had a it had an implication on uh, Carrigan, as you said, and could have an implication on the two clubs involved tonight as well. So that's. Like I, I get, I get why he was getting the credit because, like you know, it took took balls, let's say, to step in. Like it, it was really traumatic, you know, he, the way he walked up to the, <laughs> was the and got the referee. In. But you know what? It really was. And I can imagine what it looked like. Cause you had a full house there, so just the drama of it all was amazing. But just uh, as I said, when you take sentiment out of it all, I'm not sure if if I go along with the decision. Mm, he does seem like a good man, fairness, and a good county man. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, that stuff just needs to be. Oh, it needs to be a bit more formal, but um, yeah. They can... Just to say though, just I think it's on at eight o'clock tonight. I it... think that um, Man United Arsenal is on at eight o'clock tonight, but there'll be a lot of competition for for food because that was unbelievable last week. But the, yeah, just, uh, sorry, that go point on. by Paddy Cunningham as well was 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 as good, was as, good as you'll see as well. Oh my that, God. I think. We'll talk about that in performance of the weekend because that was that was just filthy stuff. So it's exactly what coaches don't want you doing, and like you know, that's just two fingers <laughs> up to people who tell you to recycle it. But um. Yeah, like and you you touched on it there. Like, so three and a half thousand people were watching this, like a, a championship football game in a club championship football game in Antrim. Like, put that into context. There's more people watching that on Twitter than there were watching the All Ireland football final on Sky. Do you know, That's like, crazy. yeah, I saw it, that. Yeah. And this is sort of my argument then for free kick shootout. It's like it just adds to the drama of it. Like, yeah. And, and yes, like you know, it's not nice to lose, and you hear this in soccer all the time. Like, you know, nobody deserves to go out and penalty shootout, but. As you say, you have to decide it some way, and there's no nice way to lose anyway. Like, you know, last minute free, 
exactly. it's just as bad as uh, losing a free kick shootout. And for a neutral, like the stats prove it. Like if more people hadn't known this, imagine this was a Sunday night. It was Thursday night, and like it just happened out of nowhere. If people hadn't known that there was a chance of this going to a free kick shootout beforehand, there would be more than three and a half thousand people watching it live. There's more to watch it since. Yeah. How, like how many people tune in to crap games of football yeah. once, you know, maybe 10 minutes ex- into extra time once they realise that there's a, like the, even the mere prospect of it going to penalty. <laughs> yeah. And like you, like, you know, supporters of supporters of the teams involved and obviously the players involved, you have sympathy for them. But like those same players, if they know that two other clubs are involved in a free kick shootout two weeks later, I can guarantee they'd be tuning into it on Twitter. Yeah. You know, there, there, will be, there will be some victims on that, like in this. But like you have to remember that like no matter how... A game has to end sometime. You know, whether it's after replays or whether you play extra periods of extra time. And at that stage, because at this stage you're talking about, especially in, in, in you know, club football where there's probably been a replay already, it's gone to the point where it's going to be a cruel way to end the game no matter, you know, no matter how you end the game, yeah. I suppose. So if, if, if there's an element that kind of appeals to, to you know, get, kind of gets more spectators and stuff like that, you know, like, well, I, I know I'd be all for it while having sympathy for the people involved as well. Yeah, but just being delighted that you're not part of it and, <laughs> and kicking back. Yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> um, and the, back in Galway, so we're talking about Galway a lot in this uh, off-season, but they're they're uh, on the road now to deciding a new senior football manager, so four nominees have been put forward. Parik Joyce, no surprise, has been one of them. Galway legend, obviously under-20 manager this year. Uh, joining them, three interesting names, so... Liam Cairns is one of the nominees, obviously outgoing from Tipperary. And Liam Cairns is not something to be sniffed at. So, like, no. Leash, Tipperary, Limerick. Now, he took Limerick to two Monster Finals. Obviously, he took Tipperary to the all Ireland semi-final, got a couple of promotions with them. He was also manager of Aherlow in Tipperary Club scene in 2010 and won the championship with them. Anybody it's sort of... Is able to break up the club commercial juggernaut is doing a good job there. So like he's got credentials. A lot of players speak highly of him, including our own Woolley, who had him at leash. And mm. um, it's an interesting name they, they pop in there. Matt Duggan, the Galway junior manager. Um, <laughs> actually, I thought like this this might uh, rouse some emotion amongst Galway fans because I just saw one of the results there in the semi final back in was it July this year? They beat Meath seven seventeen to five twenty two. Do you know, so that would be a complete departure from the Kevin Walsh era. Um, the last two finals, uh, the Galway Juniors, um, two finals in a row to Kerry, obviously. And the last one, Alan Flynn, 40-year-old from Tume. He was the Galway under-21 manager in 2013 when he was just 33 and he won the All-Ireland with them. When he was just 26, he took Cahir Lestran uh, in 2005, coached into the Galway and Connacht intermediate titles, got the All-Ireland final as well. And he was in with Keane O'Neill uh, at Kildare this year. So he's got big pedigree. He's been coaching for a long time. And some people, they just are sort of born coaches, right? Mm. Yeah, completely. Like, I, I, don't know, I don't know a whole lot, a whole lot about um, Alan Flynn, but you mentioned uh, Doug and the junior manager mm. there. Um, like, I, I mean, my, my kind of exposure to him would be limited to what I've seen. There's, there's a few lads from my club involved with the, the Mayo junior side. Yeah. So I've seen them against Galway the last couple of years as well. And like... Um, uh, I thought the Mayo Mayo team was was quite strong, but they never they didn't look like beating Galway either this year or last year. They're really impressive um, against Mayo. It was uh, I think yeah 2017 I think, and it was before the the senior game and and, and it wasn't a hiding, but like they it was they they, they should, probably shouldn't beat them by more than they actually did. And you said losing to Kerry in the two finals as well because like I I've seen Mayo teams getting hammered by Kerry because mm. they they treat their junior side differently. You know, it's kind of used as a developmental panel yeah. to, the, to the senior team, so they tend to be particularly strong. So he's got some good credentials there. And then um, just on Liam Kearns, like uh, like the, the, he's got um, like his track record, as you mentioned, there would be brilliant. I think this this is a step up. This is a level up from. So I suppose he went from uh, you know maybe well when he had Limerick they were quite strong actually, but then Leash and Tip like along kind of similar lines, especially when he got tipped to the, to the semi final. But I think Galway would be the biggest job yet. And I suppose my only thing on that is. I I think I remember saying last week that I think he had come to the like if he had come to the end of the road with yeah. um with Tipperary I think they, they needed a fresh voice. That's not to say that was his fault. Some, as I said last week, sometimes things just come to a natural end. But I just think that the competition against them and because a lot of it is homegrown might go against them and just and not 
not because of that meeting that I that I bore witness to last week <laughs> that, I, that I'm not going to bring up again. But I just I just feel there's a kind of a there's, there's a, a momentum building behind um, behind Park Joyce, like he um, really good brand of football with a really good under twenty team, and just obviously his legendary status from from within the county and just kind of following him, you know, kind of from afar. He's he's, he's done a lot of kind of AIB columns and stuff. And uh, he's kind of been intimating that his his approach would be different to, to what Kevin Welsh has done in years, which which in in recent years, which I'd imagine would kind of lend a, lend an appeal to the traditionalists in Galway as well. So, um, like with, with, like obviously nothing set in stone yet. So, but I, I say that the smart money is on Joyce at this stage. Yeah, I just I'm uh, doing a bit of reading. Obviously, Joyce probably is uh, the clear front runner, and I think he w- he will get it. But um. Just, I was interested in this Alan Flynn fella. I just, <laughs> I decided to go all in on him, and I found out he's an operations manager as well. And I thought, geez, there, it's exactly what you need to be when you're a manager. Like you know, yeah. when you're a coach, I think for me and just in my personal and professional life, it's always like, ah, you know, don't worry, it'll all fall into place. Like, but somebody like that, when you're managing a county setup, you need to be as organized and as clever. Or with you need everything. to have an operations manager if you're not one. Yeah, yourself, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But even the fact that they'd be thinking that way, and like you know, Kevin McStay has always been very good at talking about the, uh, you know, the, the struggle for for managers, like you know, the amount of money they have to raise and all the, mm. you know, all the travel and everything they need to organise outside of just being able to coach a, a bloody football team. So somebody like that who is doing it every day, like you know, I think it you know, really would sort of stand to them. Now maybe there's a potential that he could because he's been a coach. He was coaching Kildare this year. Maybe, you know, maybe Parry Joyce could bring him in. Under under his wing yeah, as well. Yeah, potentially, yeah. yeah. And he's still young. You said he was what? 20, he just, he was in his 20s. I yeah, think, he's 39 he or 40 now. Yeah. So he's still like, I suppose he still has time to, to build his kind of um, his coaching credentials and, and potentially, you never know, as, as, potentially as, as part of a management team involving some of the some of the people that are there already. But I know, I, I'm just thinking back because when you mentioned operations as well, I'm thinking of uh, Davy Fitz is another man that's really good at that. Um, you know, especially when like, managing and you know, managing the stuff that the external stuff that not everybody thinks of, and particularly when it comes to fundraising within the county. But when I mentioned Davy Fitz, I just remember that uh, I'm not going to make any predictions about Galway football because <laughs> I predicted Davy Fitz would take the Galway job last week, and within hours he he committed to Wexford. So I think it's the one so, prediction yeah. I got right on the GA. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Take my word is nothing anyway. Yeah. Well, fixtures, fixtures, fixtures. You said we'll probably talk about fixtures this year, and here we go again. So. Uh, back in Cairo, this is the same sort of thing that happened with the Camogie and Ladies Football in Kula in Dublin. It's happening now with the Football and Hurling in Cairo. So Ballin Killen, senior hurling team, were kicked out of the championship. That's a report from Cairo Lives, and they were kicked out um, after a dispute arose over the scheduling of the club's semi final. So um, they said that they, they could not fulfil their Sunday fixture because they had a game on the Saturday as well. Um, Cairo Live understands that the county board have now awarded the match to Neve Mullen. So um, they were supposed to be in the hurling game on Sunday, and they had a football game on Saturday. This, this thing's happening all over. Like this is the problem for mm. for dual players and dual clubs. They did release a statement, so they said last Sunday the club learned via social media that the intermediate football semi final between Kildavan, which would be their football team, and Neve Owen had been scheduled for the preceding Saturday evening, six p.m. So a game on Saturday evening, six p.m. On confirming this report, we immediately contacted the county board with a request that either of these fixtures, the one on a Sunday or the Saturday, be rescheduled. Uh, there are five Ballin Killen hurlers involved with the Kildavan panel, and the club took the view that to ask players to play two important matches within 18 hours of one another was unjust, against player welfare and against the player development pathway. We have therefore informed the county board that we cannot fulfil Sunday's fixture and have again requested the fixture to be rescheduled. So it looks like they've... They've actually just been sort of knocked out of the hurling championship now because of that, and like I sort of uh, uh, this is a real, real tough one because, like, uh, on the one hand, like they, they were set aside hurling weekend, so I don't know how this is like you know football has come on to the same weekend as hurling in Carlo. Carlo obviously have been out of the hurling championship and the football championship for a long time, so how is it only coming until now? You know to get this wrapped up. See, part of me always thinks I have a bit of sympathy for the GA because, like, you're you're trying to manage two sports effectively, um, and do that um, like throughout thirty two counties. But it seems like you know there's been enough time here for Carlo just to try and you know get these games out of the way. One hundred percent. Like from what I could read as well is that like there's only um there's only five week- weekends of the entire year set aside for the just five. Championship. 
I, I, yeah, from what I could read anyway, I'm yeah. not 100% that, uh, not 100% on that, so I don't want to commit to it. But that's what I thought. That it was five weekends of the entire year set aside for the Senior Hurling Championship because there's obviously, like, hurling is quite strong in Carlow considering that there's not many there's not many teams involved. That's it. There's only a handful. I'm not sure the exact number, but it's, it's not a whole lot. So when they have only that, that number of weekends of the entire year set aside for hurling and somehow an <clears throat> intermediate football semifinal involving one of the clubs that will be involved in the semifinal, there are obviously five players that are going to be involved in the hurling semifinal schedule for the previous yeah. evening. So I've no idea how I've no idea how that passed, especially as you said with uh, Carlo and Carlo haven't been out of the football and the hurling for that long. Yeah, and it, it must be something to do with the championship structure within within Carlo that um, you know maybe takes so many games to get to the the, the knockout stages or the semi final stages, and then as happens in a lot of different counties, tends to pile up on each other at this time of year. We mentioned Antrim there. You know, just the, the the game we were on about the free kicks on Thursday night, but that's one of numerous examples. I mean, one that I've a few that I've seen lately. You mentioned the the cool one as well. I've seen a lot of kind of ladies examples lately, where I think there was another one in Tipperary, where players have been asked to sometimes on the same day, never mind in the same. Mm. Um, but I, what 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 bothers me about this is that it always takes the people involved to raise it as an issue, as opposed to administrators flagging this in the first place. You know, when they're when they're scheduling games. And they say, oh, well, we've got this game on a Saturday and this game on a Sunday. Okay, we'll just go ahead. And then it's like, rather than them having already noticed it, it takes the clubs involved to have to flag it, make a big issue of it, and actually bring it to bring it to light for it to, for people like us then to make an issue of it rather than be spotted in the first place. So yeah. I, like, I, I'm not coming with a solution. It's just like a real sympathy and, and support for, for Ballon Killen, who were affected. The, the, the football club were playing the intermediate semi final, or Kildavan, they're in full support from what I could see as well just a lot of the people involved in the club community and especially the hurling community in, in Carlow are, mm. are fully on their side as well. So um, it comes back to, I mean, we have this conversation at this time every year yeah. <laughs> and, and probably different different stages throughout the year as well. But that, that the fact that it can, it can be allowed to keep on going, I'm like, I, I don't know what to say at this stage. Yeah, we're the same. We're the same conversation basically every month, every year. Like you know, it goes in yeah, cycles. Like it, it goes from club fixtures to rule changes to championship structures to and then we get into analysis and fairness for a good chunk of it, which is always a nice, a nice relief. But yeah, I don't like as you yeah, say yeah. five weekends. Like you know, and if you even start at your championship in August, September, like you know, when whenever the Leinster starts in, it's not like it's taking up a big chunk of things. Like so, mm. like to impede on one of those like, you know, minuscule amount of weekends that you've given to Hurling is very strange. And I just don't understand. Like, you're saying about you didn't have a solution there, but, like, why does it have to be on a Saturday? Why does the game have to be Saturday and Sunday? Why not have one on a Wednesday? Like, people, like, dual players are very resilient. Like, they, they understand that what they're doing is, is a big ask. Like, you know, and that's why, as you say, it only takes... It's only when a club flags something or a player flags something that we start talking about it. But for the most part, all over Ireland county colleges whatever like they all just get on with it and it's really bloody tough but i remember uh club swatra and Derry. they won the intermediate football and the senior hurling championship this was about six seven years ago and um they went in the intermediate semi-final the football semi-final went to a replay and they played the replay on the wednesday night and then had the hurling final on the sunday and there wasn't like you know any outcry about that. That was just them thinking, well, you know, we drew the semi finals, so we have to play the replay now and we'll get ready for the the final that like mm. you know, and they were just sort of managing it themselves. I just don't understand how you get to this situation. Like obviously if their game their football game had been on a Saturday and they're supposed to play a final on a Sunday, then it would have been much worse. Like it should yeah. be the common sense. They offer them the Wednesday at least, like, you know, and see how that goes. I just, I, like, just, just on that, I can't speak for the personal situations of, of the people involved, but I know that, like, let's say that happened in, um, I think it was, uh, it was either 2016 or 2017. It was, it was the year that um, Mayo would have been involved in, in the, the All-Ireland Final, probably 2016 because uh, that, that year went to a replay, so push, push back club games of Mayo a bit further. But uh, obviously Mayo is further away from, from Dublin, let's say, than, than Carlo, but um, games were played on replays were played on the Wednesday night on Wednesday nights that year mm. but it was really at a stretch because uh, sure, I speak for my own situation but like for me to have to get down from Dublin to yeah. Mayo during the week you know have, have, you know, if you're in college or you're working in Dublin so like, I, I don't know about their proximity to to Dublin or the personal situations where they're based but I imagine I imagine that came into it but but like what, if it's an option absolutely provide it yeah. you know, but if not that surely there's, you know, surely there's, 
there's enough time or enough space in the calendar from the time that Carlo are out of both championships to prevent a situation like this from happening. Yeah, absolutely. And from too many games to too little games, Bally Mun. So Bally Mun are out of the Dublin Senior Football Championship at the group stages. So um, big shock. I suppose everyone's always thinking about Bally Mun because it wasn't that long ago they were in the. You called it cutting, not for you. you I, I, I did. Jeez, I had, a, I had a good day on <laughs> Thursday, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I called Davis day, Fitzgerald yeah. and I called Nafina to beat Bally Mun. They did five points. Although I did say it would be a good game. It was pretty bloody boring. Um, but. I do have sympathy for Bally Mun again. We talked about this and the players trying to trying to integrate them back into the, the team and they do it very quickly. I went back to an old um, GAR episode where Paddy Christie was on. He managed Bally Mun in 2017 when he got to the final, lost to Vincent. And he said, I thought it was very difficult, very difficult year um, to keep everything going. You were tight on numbers during the year and then the lads came back having won in All-Ireland. It was difficult to reintegrate them. The pattern of play that you had all year has changed. So I think that has a big effect on things. From my point of view, it's nearly an impossible situation. And like, like Bally Mon, <laughs> they're like, you know, they're being punished for service in Dublin so well. And they have mm. six players in the panel at the minute, usually seven. Like Davy Byrne's been there for so many years. And it's not just any players. Like obviously every, a lot of teams have a county player and you can bring him in. Like, you know, it's usually your star players. So you can bring him in and it's going to work. But here, oh. like you have a keeper. Evan Comerford you have Philly McMahon who's played midfield centre back and full back for him played full back against Nafina so your keeper full back John Small centre back James McCarthy midfield um, David Byrne obviously mentioned but he'd be half forward Paddy Small who played off the full forward line and Dean Rock in the full forward line so every single line of the pitch is like you know has a county player in it and it's obviously your main player and that's going from like your spine, your keeper, so you can't even work on any of these things during the year, and mm. then you get them two weeks out from championship, and it's like, right, I hope we can get this together. They play in the Fina in a must-win game. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can't even have a distinguishable, a, dis- a dis- distinguishable, sorry, style of play because obviously when you have seven players of that caliber coming back in, it's going to be an entire, it's going to be dictated by those players. Do you know what I mean? You, you could you could work on something all year that 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 you want your style of play to be. But you have to adapt to what the likes of James McCarthy for the McMahon, the small Dean Rock are going to bring back. So there's, there's every chance that Ballymun are playing a completely different way in the league, let's say, to, way, to how they are playing in the championship. And they were faced with a must-win game against the FINA. So they would have, the lads would have only been with Ballymun for one game, correct me if I'm wrong, before Dublin were in the championship. And then maybe two games. Mm. And then they had to completely adapt maybe two, three weeks after winning the All-Ireland and everything that comes with that uh, to try and, as you said, must-win game in Parnell Park on, on Friday night. So I was, I was looking back, actually, the the year that... The, um, the one year that Valley Mon got to the club final, which was uh, 2013. So they would have won the Dublin County in 2012. Mm. And that was one of... Like, so Dublin haven't won it two years since 2011. And 2012 was... They got knocked out of the semi-final against Mayo... I don't think it's a coincidence that that year they went on to have their best year, getting all the way to the cup to the All Ireland Cup final, which they really should have won. Um, you know, haven't haven't got off to such a good start against Bridges that year too. So it didn't like if you were to look at any club teams around the country on paper, Ballymun are probably going to be close to the top of the list, if not top of the list, because of all those county lads. Mm. But if you look at the rest of the, the the clubs that are up there, the likes of Carfin, like there, there's been an argument about Carfin for a long time that there should be more Carfin players playing for Galway because the only in recent years after Gary Sice stepped down the, the only guarantee was Ian Burke and like this year you've had Kieran Malloy um, Martin Farrer and maybe Bernard Power and goals but they're not dead certs whereas all the dead certs for you know all the Ballymun players are nearly dead certs for Dublin the same goes for like crossing again for years they were saying that there should be more players on the Armagh team St. Vincent's had Jim Connolly outside of that you know maybe one or two yeah. here or there but none of the none of the top teams maybe Maybe Doc Croaks in, in Clarny, and I think they're maybe a different kind of kettle of fish because of the structure, the, the, the structure of the club competition in Kerry maybe allows time for them to adapt and come back in. But I don't think there's any of the top teams in football in recent years anyway that have, you know, been dominated. You know, that, that their core has been dominated to um, with county players to the extent that the Ballymun has. And the, the sad thing for them is that like it's it's likely going to continue like this for as long as. Um, those players are involved at Ballymun because Dublin are going to continue to be successful. So Ballymun could potentially look back on what is their golden generation. You know, they're never likely to have, you know, 
six or seven players of that caliber again, and all they might have to show for it is maybe a county final. Yeah, and obviously, like I'm sure they take a lot of pride in the fact they're playing for Dublin, but it's just such course, a shame yeah. that you have all these players that don't. Yeah, like it's almost it's funny you mentioned like Cora Finn and stuff there in Cross McGlen. It's almost about who gets to use them first. Like, so if you listen to Tony Brosnan yeah. and the like, Malloy said it before as well that they are like they are affected like their chances of playing counties affected by how well the club's doing. So Tony Brosnan doesn't really get a look in because he, he's with Crooks all year and the same with Cora Finn. But here it's the other way around. It's like you don't get to play with the club because you're playing with the county. Yeah. So like imagine these boys had have all been playing with Ballymun. They won all their titles. You know, like this has happened from the start of their career. There might be some of them not dominating with Dublin now because they wouldn't be coming back to Dublin yeah, until April. Yeah. Do you know, so it's yeah. just a funny one like to see who gets to use them first. But because Ballymun weren't winning when they first came in, they can't, like they got into the Dublin setup. Obviously they're all Dublin standard, but yeah, they probably would have got called up anyway and then Ballymun would have had the heart ripped out of them. Yeah, and the thing that's unfair on the sorry to, to interrupt there, but the thing that's unfair on the likes of, of, of Tony Brosnan, there's been countless examples of this for years as well, is that by the time they get the chance to make any sort of impression. So you know, occasionally club pairs go in during the league, but often by like oftentimes if they get to a club final, they're not going back in with the county till April, by which stage everybody else has been training for probably four to five months and had a chance to make a really good impression in the league. So, you know, you have to really make the most of, unless you're an established player like the Gooch was, let's say, or even Gavin mm. White now for Crokes. But the likes of Tony Brosnan had to make an instant impact. And if they didn't make it an instant impact, they weren't going to be involved with the county. And they were only paying the price for their success at club level. So at least that'll be addressed in some ways with the with the changing of the, the, the club calendar until December. But you mentioned the other way around. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. Tough on Bally Monday, so it's probably going to be going to be that way for the foreseeable as well. Yeah, that's it. Well, next up, Willie is chatting to new Kildare manager and Kerry legend Jack O'Connor. Okay, so delighted to say new Kildare manager Jack O'Connor joins us on the line now. Welcome to the Leinster Championship, Jack. Yeah, thanks, Colin. Looking forward to it. Come here, talk to me about how much persuasion was taken to bring you up this part of the world. I just came out of the blue, to be honest with you, Colin. It wasn't something I was, I was planning. I just retired from teaching in, in uh, May there, last was 30 something years. Uh, and I was planning on, on, on taking it handy for a year and maybe going off doing a few things that I hadn't done before. Uh, so I kind of came out of the blue and I, I just thought about it for a few days and, and so that I'd have a go at it because, um, you know, I, I have connections up there. My two lads are up in, 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 in Kildare and they play with the Morsi Club there in Newbridge. Yeah. So I've been up and down for the last three or four years. So it, it, it isn't as if it is um, completely new to me. You know, I have a good idea of the, of, uh, the, the, the club scene up there and, and uh, worked a little bit with, with Ross Davin with Morsi. So, um, so I just thought it was a good stick because, you know, it's, it's the it's the first time I suppose that, that I was in a position to do something like this because you you, you know if I was working full time in Kerry it, it, it wouldn't be a runner. Yeah, no. So you're gonna you're gonna drive up and down like I mean you're not gonna base yourself in Kildare or anything like that. Ah uh, well, well, we'll see. Sure, I might stay an odd night, but I I I I feel that I'd be able to commute up and down. Yeah, because um, you know the roads the roads are decent now, especially you know from Limerick on. So. Uh, it's not too bad. I I I think I'll be okay. It depends on depends basically on traffic and what what hour of the day or night that you're travelling. It's not too bad of a thing if you if you're travelling when the traffic isn't too too heavy. You know. Yeah. No, it won't be too. Listen, it worked for Mick O'Dwyer. So listen, it it it, it it's not without precedent. Uh, driving up and down to Kildare. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's roughly the same spin for me. I'd say, it's give or take two hundred miles from from there to Saint Finance Bay where I live, back back between Dallas Kelly's and Port McGee on the coast there. So. It's a good spin, but it, it, it's doable. You know, I have the time. At least I have the time now, and uh, and I said I feel I still have the energy to do it. You know. Well, that's the thing. I'm sure Mikko's name has been brought up to you plenty of times since you took the job. He's the the last All Ireland winning Kerry manager to take over Kildare. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, he he created a big start up there at the time, and uh, he a lot of adapted Kerry supporters started uh, supporting Kildare. You know, because I'd be right to Mikko. So. Um, 
I could create half the stir that he that he created, sure we wouldn't be doing too bad then. Yeah, that's the thing, and he like he did really create a stir because, like, I mean, the support Kildare had back in those days was like fanatical, and like, I mean, it was almost a little bit like Mayo, and that's fallen off for whatever reason, Jack. You know, I'm sure you're you're aware, like, the support hasn't been there, so maybe creating that stir is important again. Well, absolutely. You know, you, you know, you it's sure the, the the players feed off the supporters and, and vice versa, and. So I suppose our, our first job is, is is to try and give the support to something to show the vote and, and, and hopefully get uh make 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 the team attractive to follow and to watch and, and that's our first priority and, and uh, you know it's um you know people follow each other. It's a bit like the you know, I was in, in Newbridge there a couple of years ago when, when, when the that famous game with Mayo was there and there was there didn't seem to be too anything wrong with with killing our supporters that evening anyway, that's for sure. You know, so the support base is there I feel and, and it's a good football in county. So it's just a matter of trying to Trying to get us, uh, trying to trying to get back winning and and and, and creating uh, you know a bit of interest again among the supporters. Yeah, you mentioned how familiar you are familiar you are with uh, Kildare club football with your two young fellows um, playing with Moorfield. Would you have seen a lot? Would you know like, will you have to hold trials now, or you think you're on top of it from seeing a lot of club games over the last few years? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, the the two lads that I had that, that I bring in with me, Ross Clavin and Tom Cribben. Yeah. Would be very familiar with the club scene, you know. Um, so uh, I'd be relying on them quite a lot. But uh, you know, I, I'd have seen the majority of the players because most of have been involved at the, you know, in, in, in the latter stages of the championship for the last two or three years, and I'd been I'd been at all those games. So I'd have come across a lot of the a lot of the players. But obviously, there'd be some players, we say, with intermediate clubs and that 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 I wouldn't have seen. Though I'd, uh, you know, in the other legs to give me the heads up on that. Yeah, you like. I mean, the last uh, your last year ma- managing at inter county level was two thousand and nine at senior level. You obviously staying involved. Obviously, you won all Ireland's with the minors, and you've been with the under twenty one. Have you noticed a big difference in set of managerial setups and backroom teams? Like, I mean, I see you have Tom Cribben and Ross uh, Glavin. Like you, like you said, you'll probably have to make a few more appointments to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah, well, I was involved until uh, I was involved until 2012. Um, oh, really? 2009 was the last. Well, last last Ireland win, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I've I've kept my eye in since. I, I was involved with the minors in 14 and, and 15, and, and with the 21s and 20 since. Uh, but it's a diff- you're right, it's a different level, and and uh, the size of backroom teams. I mean, all you have to do is listen to to um, the Tipperary captain there. Um, and he was given his acceptance speech there. Jamie Callan, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he, he uh, spent a long time talking about the different uh, guys in the back room. So, uh, yeah, it has. But look, uh, you know, and players kind of demand that, no, you know, it's not a case that you can wind back the clock. I think, I think you know, players are, uh, I think Jared McGrath made the point that, you know, most players now are going to total level and their computer notes with what the other counties are doing. So um, you can't get anyone back to the clock. That's, that's a given now that you're still a big backroom team. But I, I mean, the fundamentals still don't change. It's a matter of getting the team fit and, and, and picking the right players and gelling them, you know, as a team and, and, and um, you know, get, getting the right information uh, during the match and, 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 and post-match on, 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 on how certain players are performing. So, Look, the fundamentals don't change too much, and uh, it doesn't matter what size your backroom team is. It's, it's the it's the way you use the information that you're given, you know. Yeah, exactly. Have you spoken to the players yet? Like, I mean, the big talk of Kildare this year was players obviously not committing. Daniel Flynn is the big one. I know he was at home this year playing. He'd gone away and came back, but didn't commit. Niall Kelly obviously went away, came back. Are you playing with a full deck? Or the injury? Then there was the terrible injury situation that they had this year as well. Is it looking positive from a, a point of view that you'll have everybody involved? Well, I, I mean, I was only, um, I was only appointed there the other night, so I, okay. I, I basically, I basically left the, uh, left things lying until then, you know. So, um, look, I, I've spoken to some, some players and players I've spoken to are very enthusiastic and and uh, mad for road. So, you know, I'd be hoping to have pretty much a full deck. I, I think there might be one or two players that 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 have uh, committed to going travelling for a year or for some few months. So uh, that may still happen. But by and large, you know, the players that spoke with are very enthusiastic and, 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 and want to have, want to get going and want to, you know, uh, have a real go at it next year. Yeah. Kildare are rivals of Leash, but I've no problem saying it's a great job, Jack. It's a great, they've great potential. They're a Super 8 team. You know, they were a Super 8 team last year. 
and they've got big physical strong players you know they've scorers they've they've uh, a dominating midfield if you want it you know it, it it was an attractive job i'm sure when you were approached for it uh yeah absolutely Colm. i mean look it, i uh, I, just, I i don't think you see because that you know since i left the Kerry set up i i got a few offers from outside counties uh previously but i wasn't i wasn't in a position to to um to do to, to to take up take those offers seriously uh, because I was still teaching full time in, in, in Kerry and it's, it's just not doable to leave Kerry at five o'clock in the evening and 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 and, and train wherever at, at half seven that night it's just not doable yeah. so it, it was the first time that I was in a position to accept um, a job like this and uh, just so happened it was Kildare and um, um, I must say that the fact that I had connections up there my my two boys are up there and I go up there quite a lot anyway and. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd be I'd be watching them playing anyway, so and, and and doing a little bit with the club up there. So from that point of view as well, and 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 I know how much you know passion there is for football in Kildare, and um, fierce interest in it. So you know, you know, absolutely, it is. I feel it is an attractive proposition, and the key the key is that you know I I think there's improvement in them. You know, that they really and truly Kildare sh- should be um, a solid. Division One team uh, and should be competing for the for the Super Eight uh, virtually every year. You know, I, I I agree with you there. Yeah, there's no there's no doubt. What about the style of play? Because in fairness, Kildare, you had a, a style of play with Kerry, which is a traditional Kerry style of play. You know, kicking, catching, that kind of thing. And Kildare wouldn't be a hundred miles away from that in the last couple of years. And the trend now in Gaelic football, maybe you got out at the right time, Jack, in 2012, where you missed all this awful uh, hand passing games we had and it seems to be moving back yeah. again towards yeah. more catching and kicking football yeah well I think I think the realisation has has, has, has uh, dawned on people that, that you know that uh, very defensive side only gets you so far you know I remember being down at um, being down at Killarney at, 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 at the National League game the first game of the year this year watching the young Kerry team taking on Tyrone and I couldn't understand for why Tyrone for love of money wouldn't kick the ball. I was actually actually met Peter Canavan up in the hotel in, in the in the Marlton afterwards. Uh he was there with his young 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 son because his 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 other son uh you came on as a soft for Tyrone. Yeah. And I was saying I said, Jesus Peter, why why you know, why you why isn't that kicking the ball like and uh, and he was shaking his head as well that they, they were you know, they were they were just trying to work with him. Kerry were Kerry were getting bodies back and it was going nowhere and, and Lo and behold, as the year went on, uh, Tyrone realised that you know they have to go that way. So they put a, a good, a big target man in full forward in McShane, and and uh, at times Matty Donnelly. So it, it is a more effective style of football, uh, and I think that's that's dawning on that's dawning on, on 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 managers and coaches around the country. And um, you know, I mean, I know so it's it, 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 uh, for door for door, but you know, you saw what the likes of. Donny Crowley and 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 and, and Kieran Donny did for us back yeah. in back back in the days, you know. And uh, in many ways, I think it's gone full circle that if you, if you, there's still room for a target man uh, in the full forward line, if you can if you can get the quality of ball uh, in there, and it's not a matter, you know, you have to have to be refined and can't be just foolishness and all. But there really, of course, you can mix it. I mean, you you, you don't have to be a slave to it, but. It is a fantastic option if, if if you can if you can have that kind of a man that you hit a a dag or ball to from forty five fifty yards and, and and he can bring other players into it. So um, you know I'll be, what we'd be trying to do is find <laughs> find that find that target man or two and and, and get get other guys um, you know helping out in in, in different facets. Yeah, in and around him as well. And of course, there's an offensive mark which could easily be in the championship next year. It was trial during the league this year. I'm sure that'll be voted on, I'm pretty sure, at the next Congress. So that could be in for next year's league and championship. Yeah, it could be, and it would certainly encourage that kind of kicking. And you saw how effective Tommy was, was, was for Kerry in the league. And um, yeah, that, 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 that certainly is, is something that, that, that would, I think would, would make. The, the, the footpath more prevalent, you know. Yeah. So, do would you do you do most of the coaching yourself, Jack, or would you will you would does Ross do a little bit of the coaching? I'm not um, sure. Yeah, I, I I like coaching myself, but but I realise as manager that you have to share it around a bit, you know. So, uh, <laughs> Ross, Tom's Ross well, is well able, able to do it too, and Tom too. Yeah. So you know the days of selectors standing around, 
you know, watching training is long gone. So the way training anywhere is devised nowadays, Colin, you 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 break the group up into different uh, sectors and, and, and uh, you know, you might have stuff going on in two or three different stations. So there'll be plenty there'll be plenty for everyone to do, you know. Yeah, no there will. Come here, I meant to ask you about the under twenties and obviously Kerry won the five in a row minor and a lot of their best players went straight to senior and missed the under twenties. Like as a I'm completely against that. I think it makes a farce of the under twenty competition. Just wondering what your opinion is on it after managing for two years um at under twenty. Yeah, well I suppose um, I suppose I'm probably in a better position to comment on it than anyone because I, I, I lost out on, on, on David Clifford and yeah. and and last year on Shawnee Shades, you know, the two, not alone are the two best under 20 forwards in the country, they're now probably two of the best senior forwards in the country. So, and and we, we were beaten in the semi final by a point, so you can imagine how frustrated uh, I was after that game, you know. So, um, look, I'd sum it up like this. I mean, how can you, how can you take a, a competition seriously when, when the best players aren't allowed to play in it? That's the way, it, that's the way you look at it, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, it really takes from the competition that someone like David Clifford couldn't play in it. Not so, that's that's the that's the be all and end all of that sort of thing. Yeah, you know? and that's it. And like I mean, I was using the example recently on the show here that Leash beat Mead in the under twenty one in Leinster, and it was just so happened that the date fell on the week after Leash were knocked out of the senior championship, so they got their senior lads back, and Mead were still in it, so they were down their seniors. Do you know what I mean? There, there's a completely unfair situation that that game fell yeah, at the time. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it, if you leave if you leave something kind of the, the goodwill of you know of a, of, of, of the people involved with the senior team, then then that's you know that's 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 not really a good way to, to run it. I mean, for example, this year uh, we lost another good player, Dean O'Connor, who featured with Kerry in the league, but isn't featuring now in the championship. Uh, whereas Cock was well known that Cock had three or four or five players that the seniors were looking at, but they they stuck with the twenties and right. you know fair play to them. It, it came it came came right for them and they and they won the the other twenty championship. So I mean, look, it's it's just a fast of a setup where where some counties can have their players and other counties don't have them. And so it's an uneven playing field then. And you know, I was just I suppose a bit unlucky that that, that the, the people that I, the lads that I was denied were just absolutely exceptional players. You know. Yeah, the top class player. Just just to finish up there, you're going to have the same issue I'd say with Kildare then because they've won f- they've won f- uh, three of the last five minor titles. So they've got great and they've been beating Dublin in them as well, which is important. And they won the All Ireland under twenty, obviously in two thousand and eighteen. So you are going to have that balance and act with some good young lads coming up through the ranks as well. Yeah, but I, long term column, I can't see that under twenty competition surviving. You know, I, 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 to be honest with you. If it was up to me, I'd just have the one competition. I'd have another nineteen competition because yeah, it's uh, you know, I, I, I think the minors, the minors are too young to be playing in 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 front of the crowds they're playing in front. You know, they're still only developing and still physically not able for you know the rigors of of, of that hard inter county training. So I think possibly a number 19 competition and all players to be available uh, at that age group uh, and you know once they're once they're over 19 then you know if they're, if, if they're ready for senior then so be it but I think that's the way a long term it, it would have to go because certainly the under 20 competition hasn't been satisfactory up to now No, no fi- Finally you mentioned the Super 8s is a definite target for you I presume breaking Dublin's stranglehold on the Leinster Championship while it's difficult they've won 14 out of 15 so like I mean someone's going to have to do it sometime as like my father said but it, you know it's easier said than done Yeah look we won't be making any uh, sweeping promises or whatever we, you know we just be trying to take it bit by bit and try and build a, a good squad and a competitive squad and and then a cohesive, a cohesive team and a cohesive unit. So, um, of course, we'd love to you know try and get back into Division One and, and and because you really have to be competing in Division One to, to to you know to think seriously to making a big impact in the championship because that's where that's really well attacked. You know, anyone it's very very hard to see anyone making a breakthrough outside of the outside of Division One. So. Uh, we'll take it one step at a time and we'll, 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 we'll train them to walk before we run, Colin. Jack, thanks very much for taking the call. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Colin.
Performance of the weekend. So a lot of club action going on over the weekend and straight away I have down here Sean Elliott from Dunloy. So massive win for Dunloy. I told you to watch it. Gee, I really was having a good day on Thursday. You were on but fire last, uh, last Thursday. <laughs> no, yeah, obviously it's not a big call to say watch the Antrim Hurling final, but uh, <laughs> Dunloy cushioned all. It was a packed house in Ballycastle. Nice autumn day for it. You know, a little crisp in the air. And Sean Elliott came off the bench with 20 minutes to go and scored two goals for his club as Dunloy sort of ousted the rivals, Cush and Dahl. So massive performance from him. And one of the goals that was laid on, there was a point in it and it just went end to end from the keeper to catch and the whole way down the end of the pitch. And the, cr- like, you know, the crowd were loving it. There was kids behind the goal sort of sprinting towards it. Um, oh, it was just, just brilliant scenes, proper, proper club scenes and brilliant win for Dunloy. For Cush and Dahl at the other side, Obviously, a hard day for them, but Neil McManus, nobody would be surprised, had a massive, massive performance. Um, he scored 10 points for them. One of them, he literally ran over the top of somebody. It was, to- it was like Peter Duggan-esque for Clare. It was close control. He was under a lot of pressure and then just bulldozed someone to the ground and popped it over, sort of improvised strike. Uh, it was a great, great point for him. Um, more hurling, believe it or not. Uh, Rian Considine and Crat Lowe, the Clare senior quarterfinals. He scored 2 3. He's only 20 and he scored 2 3 in a senior quarterfinal. And one of the goals was one of the most delicious things I've ever seen. So uh, the ball was coming down the right wing and it, it got put in on top of the, the goalkeeper, basically, just sort of to- towards the left of the post as you're looking from the right. And the keeper and the fullback sort of didn't know who was going to go for it. And Rian just comes across with his hurl. Unbelievable first touch. Pick, pucks it away from the two of them, catches it before it hits the ground with the hurl, pops it up to his hands, and instead of drilling it into the net, sees the fullback coming across him and just dummies him and puts it in under the keeper who has recovered. So it was amazing skill and like just class composure then when he was under a bit of pressure. Uh, Second touch was brilliant as well. He was going at about 100 miles an hour. So yeah, yeah really, really, really it, cool. It was only, yeah, when he slowed it down, it was like, Jesus, like how, how has he done all that in that space of time? Like, yeah, as you say, 100 miles an hour. And the whole thing happened in about one and a half seconds. You know? yeah, it was yeah. brilliant, brilliant stick work. Um, up in Donegal, uh, Owen McGeechan scored a hat trick for St. Eunan's. One of them was just this class. I had Ashley McConville raving on commentary cut inside on his left foot and just for the instep drills it into the top left corner and I think that's the most difficult thing to do in football that instep across the goals into the top the top mm. corner with power though it was like, it was yeah. like he, he caressed it with power if that makes any sense it was, no. like a, it was nearly like a proper R2 or L2 finish on, uh, <laughs> on FIFA yeah. but um, I, it was his second goal as well I think he's only a young fella but it was, it was real quality yeah it was L2 off the left yeah but that's a perfect description of it um, you were watching the Kilcar game. Yeah, I saw um, saw a good bit of the Kilcar game on Saturday night. Andrew McLean got man the match. He was really good, um, really lively. Uh, he got a goal and a point. Took it very well. And to stand out in the team with uh, Owen Ryan and Mark McHugh all playing, mm. uh, Stephen and Paddy McBurdy as well. That 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 takes a lot of doing. But I wanted to um, I wanted to give mention to uh, Michael Hegarty. Um, <laughs> Still going. I think they said he was playing in his. First championship season was 96. I think he did in like his 24th championship season. Mm. So he'd been meant to start. He was wearing six. Uh, but I think he was an injury doubt. So he only came on with about uh, maybe 20 minutes to go. And at this stage, um, Killy Beggs were really coming back into it. And, and that was it was largely down to Hugh McFadden, who was threatening to win the game on his own for about 15 minutes. Had a real big purple patch. And then he kind of seemed to get a bit of an injury. And after his injury, he went in on the edge of the square. But then kind of Kilcar started to dominate out the pitch and, and one of the reasons for that was Michael Hegarty because he just calmed everything down completely. Just uh, like he just played, like nearly just slowed the game down to his own pace and dictated everything from his, from as soon as he came on. So to do that at his age was, was really good. But um, McLean, Andrew McLean, yeah, really, uh, really deserving of the man the match. Looking forward, looking forward to seeing this because this Kilcar team obviously got far in Ulster a couple of years ago. Um, and like we've seen from, um, from Guido and, and a few others, the quality of... Uh, I've done a goal club football, so I'm looking forward to seeing them again now. Yeah, Guido had a, the fright of their lives against Bondorn. Had to drag it out an extra time after blowing an eight-point lead, I think it was, up there. Mm. But um, Owen McHugh obviously doesn't really care about four steps. He took about 13 for Paddy <laughs> McBrady's goal. Um, but it was like, because when he first picked it up, he was running away from goals and slipped. So maybe the referee thought he had some sort of play on the ball there. He slipped, got back up and just ran around the, another, yeah. the marker <laughs> yeah. and eventually took a solo and popped it into... To McBrady, who finished like oh, like a coach's dream, just drilled it into the the bottom corner. But um, 
who else was there? Was somebody else in Donegal? No, actually, you're talking about Michael Hegarty, the timeless gems, Ollie Canning. He was also playing 43 years of age, playing with Port Tumna. It's the 26th season of senior hurling, 26 years, and he scored two points for Port Tumna and apparently won two frees there as well in a relegation playoff that kept them up. And not only that, it relegated Gort, who were one of the favourites to win the whole championship, and they're away down now to senior B. And Ali Canning, 43 years of age, still going strong. Amazing, you think you see you think you're thinking of retiring and then you see Ali Canning and Michael Hegarty playing well into their forties and sticking out making it in the last week of fifty sevens, like oh god. <laughs> and Crazy then stuff. yeah, and then another one, Paddy Cunningham, so back up in Antrim, just like an exhibition from him, like he just doesn't look like he's ever going to to lose his accuracy. One of them was, was Connor Cox esque, but I'd say you know, Connor Cox is just more Paddy Cunningham esque. They, they give him a man his due. Yeah. So he was down the left and he's inside the thirteen, he's on the wing and he dummies, like it looks like he's about to come back out onto his right, and instead he goes further back onto his left and hits it with the outside of his boot, and it just curves over. The umpires can't believe it, the crowd can't believe it, and it is one of those ones, you know, where you hear the coaches shout, Recycle, recycle, don't bloody yeah. shit! Ah, good score, boy! And you know, nobody cares, and <laughs> they're just all delighted that the ball went over, and, and that's it. Paddy Cunningham just does whatever the hell he wants with the ball. Yeah, certain people can get away with it. They're allowed not recycle. I guess yeah. Paddy Connor is one of them. It's going yeah. to, it reminded me of Stephen O'Neill, and I think that's uh, I think whatever about Connor Cox, you can definitely see, to compare anyone to Stephen O'Neill is, is, is a compliment. There's only a few that could be that Stephen O'Neill would do a dummy and have to call it somebody else esque. So uh, well, uh, that, that, that that's the highest compliment I could. Yeah, definitely. So the winner, I'm, it's a tough one. I don't know whether to go with an old lad or a young lad, but I think I'm going to go with Rian Considine of Cratlow just for scoring 2-3 at the age of 20 in a Clare senior quarterfinal and one of the goals, unbelievable carry-on. So, Rian, congratulations. You are the Paddy Power Performance of the Weekend. Connor, thanks very much for joining me. That is all we have time for. We are back on Thursday, so we'll see you then.